Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. I am your host, June Archer. This is the Winner Circle. This is 50.com. My guest today, an amazing actor. You have seen him on the silver screen. You've seen him on stage. And now you've seen him not only just network television, but we've seen him on cable television, stars in your living room on Sunday nights. This man has been shaking the block like something crazy. And we have the opportunity to talk to him. Please welcome to this to this amazing, amazing platform, Daniel Sunjata. Daniel, hey. what's going on, brother? What is up, man? Click, clack, get back, blow. What's you up? heard? You heard? <laughs> man, listen. Congratulations on all the recent success, but notwithstanding, congratulations on the journey, man. Mm. How has this journey been for you, stage, film, television? Uh, you went to the Tisch School of Arts. How has this journey been for you? Yeah, before I went to Tisch, I went to FAMU. A lot of people don't know I went to HBCU. I went to Florida A&M University. Um, it's been crazy, man, and it's hard to just sum it up. But, you know, I've been really blessed. I've been able to work in all three. One of my main goals was I wanted to do theater, I wanted to do TV, and I wanted to do film. And I've been able to pay my bills acting, you know, my entire career. I've never had to, you know, work another job. That's that's a very, you know, there's levels to the stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, you have yeah. like the, you've got the Leonardo DiCaprio's, the Denzel Washington's, the Don Cheadle's, the Jeffrey Wright's. I'm still kind of, I'm still, I feel like I'm still moving, trying to move in that direction. But when I tell you how difficult it is to pay your bills doing this, you know, doing this for a living, it's tough. And I, and that's, uh, I'm proud of that accomplishment. So, and you've had, a lot of success. If people really pay attention to some of the history, you were in Sex in the City. You, you, some really major and pivotal pieces of being here, being there. Now, a season regular on the Power Universe, Woo. Power Book Two, playing Mecca. Yeah, man, how did it feel to be alongside people like Mary J. Blige, <sighs> Michael Rainey Jr. Woody McLean, like some heavy hitters. Yeah. How do you feel? Well, I mean, just when you just look at the list of icons that are attached to this, to, to, to the Power Universe and Power Book Ghost 2 in particular, we're talking Method Man, you know, 50 on the production angle, uh, Mary J. Blige. Like I said, I went to FAMU, and this is how old I am. You know, when I when I went to FAMU, that's the I think my freshman year is the year that Mary dropped What's the 411. OK, Woo! that was I a good up, year. That was a I good year. I literally, I literally came up on 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 Queen Blige's music music. And um, when I stepped on set, I have to admit, man, I was a little starstruck. I was nervous, man. You know, what I, mean? I was like, oh, my God, this is Mary J. Blige, you know. Um, but some of the other people you mentioned, I would say most notably Woody McLean. The majority of uh, my scenes, of Mecca scenes involved Kane's story. And so I got to act with Woody a lot. We got real tight, real close. Um, that was amazing. Super talented dude. I just caught him in uh, The Harder They Fall. He had a cameo in that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did, man. Killed it. Killed it. Um, so no, man, it was, a, it was a true blessing. And I can still remember the day I got the call from Courtney Kemp to offer me the role of Mecca. And she was like, Daniel, you know, this, I, you, I wrote this role for you. I don't think anybody else could play this role. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you tend to get cast as, which is why I loved it. Like, you know, I, this right. is, this was a total, this was a total left turn, a total departure, um, from anything like that I had ever done in my career. Got to shave my head. I was rocking the baldy. And I want to talk, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. Like yeah. you went all the way in when you talk about acting and being that kind of actor that really sets the tone to give you an unapologetic perspective into that character mm -hmm. we've seen you with the hair we've seen you as a gentleman we've seen you something other than what we see you as as mecca like how was it just trying to jump in and dive into that role all right so courtney gives it to you and this is not going to be what you are normally used to doing mm -hmm. how, how do you prepare for something like this well first of all again i have to just give props to courtney kemp because she really over prepares her actors so in my entire 20 something year career, I've never had an on-camera job where a uh, showrunner, executive producer, creator of the show, what have you, that she gives you like a four page treatment, a four, a four page mm. treatment of what the major signposts 
for your character are going to be over the course of the season. So I knew where Mecca generally was going. I knew that he had he had these two different sides to him. You know, he had that street, you know, moving weight, drug dealing kind of side. And then he also had this romantic, you know, kind of softer, more sensitive side because his soft spot and his entire his entire motivation for every choice that he made was to get Monet and Z right. back. So you could kind of understand some of the messed up stuff he did because you knew his his intentions were good. They might have been his perspective might have been a little skewed. But right. so knowing all of that coming in, I was fully prepared uh you know by the by you know by the production itself and had all the support in the world and to go back to the baldy uh once i actually i was fi i was finding a hard time like embodying mecca but once they shaved my head and i looked in the mirror i was yeah, like that was it. that dude there he is that, that guy you know and then they gave me the gorilla pimp jackets and the, you know what i mean and i was just like man it was just it was it was awesome awesome experience now let's talk about what the people want to know Mr. International Global Snitch. <laughs> the I mean, goat. The goat of global snitch. The yeah. goat of global international. Now, you find yourself in this predicament, and it's really all to get Zeke Monet back, man. But what is the what is the underlying thing that, that keeps Nong at Mecca? What is what is Nong at him? Um, wow. Man, that's a tough one. Like, you know, one thing that I never saw. Let me tell you this. One thing Courtney did not tell me, one thing that the ghost production team never told me was that at the end of it, he was going to end up being an FBI informant and a snitch. I didn't know that till I saw that episode. I think it was episode number nine where I have that scene with Tariq in the dorm room. And right. I had that one monologue where I like tell him like, yo, you know, when you see your father, tell him I said, good looking out kind of thing. Um, so I didn't see that part coming and that was good. That was good. I think one of the reasons why she didn't tell me that was so that I would play the character totally straight the entire time. Right. And it would be even more of a surprise to the audience. Right. So when that pivot comes, it's 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 a it's a, a organic pivot. Like it's a, a, the, the pivot is there to kind of set the tone and say, man, wow. And I think yeah. I think all, all of us were very taken aback, like, oh snap. Now let me say this though. If you go back, you there was the introductory scene where you first meet Mecca, where Mecca, Kane, and Lil Guap are coming out of the back of a bar or something into an alley, and we have that confrontation with the GTG or whatever. Yeah. Um, one of the the very first thing that Kane says to me is, "You smell like a narc," and it just so it, and I wasn't quite a narc, but it just so happens that always trust that gut instinct because he was right. Oh, turned, oh, turned out man. I was not to be trusted. So. Oh, Always. Yeah. I, I want to ask you this. What is the significance of the engagement ring that you gave Mo Monet? Uh, Tariq ends up getting it and he gives it to Davis. Is that going to come back to, I mean, he's no longer on the board, but does that come back and, and tie up some loose ends for us? Like what is, what is that correlation with that ring? What does that signify? I just, the way that the, all that I saw it as it was, a, it was extremely beautiful, precious, rare gem. And he and he and and it just it it symbolized Mecca's. This is a very basic answer, but to me, it just symbolized how much he you know how much he wanted Monet. He wanted that to really land on her the right. entire time. Though he's trying to impress her with like helicopter rides. They're on the yacht. You know, he's he's offering trust funds for the kids. Um, I know you saw, I know you saw all the big body whips in the airplane <laughs> hangar. He had like. My God, bro. Pulling out all stops. <laughs> all stops. All pulling, stop. pulling out all stops, but really trying to um trying to seduce her with the kind of life that he wants to give her. And I, I just think that ring was like the, the ultimate symbol of that. And so he was really upset about losing that bag and that ring. Yeah, for sure. And, I don't think I don't think it's gonna come back again. I don't think it's gonna, I don't think that there's gonna be any further reference to it. But okay, so I, I know you're pretty familiar with the 48 laws of power. So I mm -hmm. wanna I want to put you on the spot here because there's, there's two laws here that, that come into play uh, right when you're talking about those particular moments. Uh, law 46, never appear too perfect, right? Yeah. And, then, and then you got 32, play the people's fantasies. You, you just talked about Monet is being uh, pampered and, and shown the yacht, the the, the jet, the, the gear, the, 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 the ring. How important is it when you're talking about making these moves that 
these laws come into play when you're trying to manipulate or seduce someone. Yeah, well, I mean, the you know, I guess the diehard fans, this has probably come up on some of your other episodes. Uh, the 48 Laws, Laws of Power is what inspired the creation of the, of the flagship show, Power, to begin with. That's one of the reasons why they called it Power. Power, yep. Um, yeah, I, I can't tell you that I know all 48 Laws of Power off the top of my head, but the two that you just cited, Rule Number 46 and Rule Number 32, I don't know if he did such a good job with never appear too perfect. I think he was trying to come off as perfect, you know, at least to Monet, as, as best he possibly could. Um, you know, maybe lying probably doesn't really help. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Especially when you get caught. Uh, you know, we can't get nothing past women when we do that. Like I was going to say, not that that's ever happened to not me. That, no, that's never, uh, yeah. Come on. Um, <laughs> um, but... I do think maybe he did employ law number 46 in terms of trying to get to draw Kane in. Kane was a key piece of Mecca's plan. It was his way in. You know, that's how he was going to like, uh, you know, slide in and become um, become the uh, the supplier for the Tejadas. You know what I mean? But that had to, that Kane was a key part of that. And I think there were moments where Mecca made it seem like he was like struggling with the idea. And he was like, you know, uh, uh, not, not quite sure of himself or sure of the situation, but willing to give Kane a shot kind of a thing. Right, so I right. think in, in that, in the context of that relationship, I think law number 46, he did a good job. Uh, play to people's fantasies. He, I think he, I think he employed that quite well, you know, very, very yeah. well, especially, <laughs> against, especially against Monet. I think that there were moments, there were moments where Monet was thinking about it. She was really, I think, struggling with, you know, maybe just going along with this fantasy. Um, and it wasn't just the stuff, Dan. It was, it was, spending time because her husband's in jail like so it's right. enticing you taking me out to dinner like you want to be seen in public with me the yeah fantasy of that yeah you yeah get drunk off of that you could yeah. really and she was she was leaning towards it <laughs> she was sipping that lean yeah i had her um on that lean. Yeah, he wasn't mecca wasn't expecting that uh that that was an unexpected uh kink in his plan was uh was lorenzo coming home see he wasn't expecting that yeah, so, I don't think anyone at that dinner table was expecting that. <laughs> yeah, that was a wrinkle. That was a wrinkle for sure. And I want to throw this at you. Uh, just to further focus on the 48 Laws of Power, I think Mecca executed Law 19, know who you're dealing with to the, to the T. Mm. But he neglected to implement Law 29, which was planned all the way to the end. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So we would call this, I would call this his tragic flaw. It was the reason. It was the reason why his plans fell apart. That's a very good. That's a very astute observation, brother. Um, that's the tragic flaw. It's that thing. It's if, when there's a blind spot. Yeah. It, by definition, you are not. You you cannot see. You can't see it. You know, it's something that you're. You you don't have the self awareness or the situational awareness to know that you have left. A, a you know a, a large opening for something bad to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so he just never saw it coming. And he got he got railroaded by his own short sighted vision, and that's great. Sometimes we we happen to fall into that. Um, now, Ghost and Kane, and they were very callous, very calculated. Mecca's the same way, Daniel. Same way, cut from the same cloth. What is the connection? Because you you do tell Tariq, man, tell your pops, good looking out. For those who didn't really follow the storyline, like how how was that connection made, and is there history there? Well, yeah. So I saw that there was like a rumor going on, like floating around the web that like Mecca might somehow be ghost brother or th that they're related or something. Um, I got direct confirmation from Courtney that that just was not true. But what I did think was cool was how they tied Mecca's, his arc all the way back to, you know, uh, Lobos, Lobos. and, 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 and that, that, they, that there were things that Mecca did, which had, you know, which involved ratting. Um, being a snitch, but that that ultimately resulted in Ghost's death. So that just like that just that that made that made Mecca's relevance to the Power Universe, you know, so exponentially more significant. And I thought that was really cool. You've had the opportunity to work with Fifty in this Power Universe, Courtney. Like, what have been some of the key things? It may not have been a direct conversation. Maybe watching how he moves. What has inspired you since? working on power and working with 50 cent so um i'm not gonna lie i only really got to meet 50 one time 
and it was real quick. Uh, I was in the uh, the hair and makeup chair, you know, they put making you look beautiful and everything. And all of a sudden, I just I just I see some swag coming in my peripheral vision. I turned and I'm like, oh, my God, it's 50 cent. <laughs> and he just like looked at me, gave me that smile, came over, like, you know, dap me up. And then he was yeah, out. It yeah. was like it was real quick. It was sincere, but it was real quick. But he wasn't he wasn't on set that much. And, um, you know, the man has a lot of responsibilities. So I, I didn't take it personally. I was just happy that they gave me the opportunity. Um, I mostly just saw him when we did our like we would do a weekly table read of the next script. And that was on Zoom. But, yeah, we never really got to you know, pound it out. Now, now coming from HBCU, mm -hmm. uh, very hot topic. We're, we're, we're trying to inspire our young people to take that as an opportunity to uh, go to these institutions and learn. What was that experience for you, and, and how has it helped you as a uh, th as a young man and as a grown man, uh, that experience? Well, man, um, the experience was amazing. I mean, I had such a great time down in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, I will say when I first got there, I was a business administration major. I, was, I didn't go there and start out in the arts. And I spent about one semester doing that before I realized – that was not the hemisphere of the brain in which my talents happen to lie. I'm not not good at math, not good at logistics, not good at, you know, that's really not my my lane. Um, and through a circuitous, a circuitous course of events, I ended up tripping over the theater department and I felt like I found my people. You know, theater majors are just weirdos. We're all a bunch of like gypsies. You know what I mean? Like it's just, I was like, oh, this is this is my tribe right here. Um, and then, the you know, the it, it was. It was pivotal, man, because there was a guy, there was a brother named Talvin Wilkes, W-I-L-K-E-S, I believe. And what Talvin was doing, I believe he's Princeton or Yale educated black man. Uh, he was traveling around to the HBCUs and he was performing. He was directing classical plays, kind of plays that, you know, we don't usually, uh, you know, you might do checkmates. You know, that was like Denzel Washington, and I can't remember who, Felicia Rashad or somebody on Broadway. Um, but rarely Shakespeare, rarely like, you know, uh, elevated language and, you know, classical classical text on stage. Mm. Which being, you know, that, it's not necessary, but it is um, having the opportunity to do that. It definitely broadens your skill set and prepares you to do so many different things. For, for more reasons that I could give, that we could do a whole interview about why that is the case. Right. So he comes to FAMU and he directs Hamlet and I got cast as Hamlet. So, I mean, I have no idea why I had no built, no ability. I didn't think I was going to be able to memorize the lines, you know, but this is a, this was a, uh, an experience that I had specifically because I went to FAMU, which helped prepare me, gave me the confidence. Once we got through the run of the show, I was like, wow, if I could do that, man, and people are responding, well, man, maybe I could, I don't say do anything, but maybe, maybe I have some potential here. Maybe I'm right. kind of not bad. I'm good. You know what I mean? So I got a tremendous amount of my self-confidence from my experience of Florida A&M University. I got really good foundational training. And also at that time, see, I'm a, a multi-ethnic. I don't know what the politically correct term is, but my mother, Irish and German, my father, black, now also adopted, okay, raised in a white household, went mm -hmm. to predominantly white institutions um, until I got to high school. Mount Carmel High School on the south side of Chicago has everything, Mexicans, blacks, whites, and then and then from every socioeconomic strata. Right. So when it came time to pick a college, my mom was like, Daniel, I really think you should go to a black college. I think you should go to HBCU. She wanted me to go to a, is it Hampton University? Hampton. Yep. In yeah, she, she wanted me to go to Hampton. I got in, but the tuition was couldn't afford that. It was like it was it was pretty expensive at the time. Um, so anyway, ended up going to FAMU. But what I appreciated about my mother's perspective was she was like, you're a black man. You're a black man. And, you know, you might have, you know, you, your mother might be white, but, you know, I, I think you need this experience. You know, it, it, it's going to be it's going to be pivotal in terms of you finding your sense of self and your sense of identity culturally, ethnically. You know, and it's going to affect the way you move in the world, because the way you see yourself is not necessarily the way other people see you. And they're going to treat you according to the way, according to their perception of you, 95 percent of the time. Not everybody does that, but it's kind of human nature. Right. So, man, for all those reasons, I didn't mean to go on such a long digression, but for all no, those. I love reasons, it. I love it. You was uh, was key, was key. Now, now with that, I want to ask you this. What 
during that time or, or throughout that journey, uh, what was the best piece of advice that you were given from your mom uh, that you could give someone who's struggling to uh, pay a bill, get through school, put their kids through school, trying to find the light at the end of the tunnel that you were given by your parents that you you live by or you tap into every now and then? Yeah. I, one thing that she would always remind me is that um, she she was like the only what did she used to she said that like the only constant in the universe is change or something. And what she meant by that was don't get too high with the highs. Don't get too low with the lows. You know, you always got to keep li life must live. So we ha you got to always be putting one foot in front of the other. You get knocked down seven times, get up eight, get knocked down nine times, get up ten. Um, but she said that at a time when things weren't going very well. And basically what she was saying between the lines is if you can if you could count on anything, it's the fact that if things are bad right now, eventually they have to get better. You know, right. and, you know, as we go through the vicissitudes of life, doesn't really even matter what color we are, you know, or, or whatever, where we come from. That's a that's a key. That's a key insight. I, I want to ask you this, then. Uh, what I am super excited about is vicissitude, sequitus, right? Like yeah. you obviously read. What are you reading currently? Oh man, um, believe it or not, I'm reading. I'm reading. The, uh, I never finished the Forty Eight Laws of Power. I can't. It's, it's around. It's around here somewhere. So lately, I've been <laughs> lately I've been reading the Forty Eight Laws of Power, <clears throat> and the other one is uh, I'm about to go get it right now. Hold up. If you're tuned in. We're talking to the amazing Daniel <laughs> Sunjata. It's and, this um, one. It's called "You Are the Placebo." Making Your Mind Matter by Dr. Joe Dispenza. So those are those are the two things I'm reading right now. I'm just impressed by the vocabulary and I love learning new words. I love reading. So I really appreciate that uh, you you shared that with us. Um, I'm going to ask you this, man. Music is a soundtrack to our lives. Up to this point, what song best represents your journey or what what artist represents your journey up to this point? Well, I have to go really off the top of my head with Bob Marley and part of the part, part of the reason it's not only it's for all the reasons I don't need to, I mean, the man was larger, larger than life. Amazing. But you know, I didn't know I was a fan of Bob for at least 10 years before I found out that his father was white and his mother was black. I just thought he was black. I never, never knew that he was, that he was multi-ethnic. Yeah. So that be as I had already been a fan. And when I say a fan, I mean the lyrics and everything. I watched every documentary, like just was crazy about Bob Marley. Uh, when I found that out, I just felt even more kind of like, you know, in, endeared to like his his spirit and what. And so he meant he represented even more to me in a, in a certain way than he than he did in general, I think, to the world. So I, I always hold him real close to my heart. Yeah, he's the artist. Did you ask for the song? Uh, if you have a song, definitely let us know. There's a, there's a for, 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 forever loving Ja. Forever wow. loving Ja. Yeah, that's 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 the one. That's a dope. Right? I, I, and I know I know the catalog because I'm Jamaican, so I, I know the catalog mm. and it's, it's hard to choose. But for you to share that one, I think that's amazing. It's going to inspire someone. Uh, if you were to come back, Mecca, if Mecca were to come back, if he actually if he could do it all over again, who would he get rid of? Man, wow. Who would he have gotten rid of? Huh? Mm. If you put Mecca back on that on a board, mm -hmm. who does he eliminate? in order to stay on the board? That is a real tough question, man. I mean, I think, I think he would have, you know, once I think he was, I thought that Lorenzo and Mecca were on a collision course. I, what I thought was at the end of the season, we were going to be sending our street soldiers after each other. And we were going to end up having like a, um, well, a Vin Diesel, <laughs> Dwayne, the rock Johnson, like Knock down, drag out, fight, you know, but it, it didn't it didn't end up going that way off the top of my head. I would say eliminate Lorenzo because he's like he was the he was the threat. He was like it was it was it's me or him in terms of Monet's right. choice. Right. He's standing in the way of Monet. He's kind of standing in the way of Monet. And he's a powerful you know, he's a form he would be a formidable enemy. So a powerful, a powerful individual in the context of the show. That's my best answer off the top of my head. I don't think I would get rid of Kane. You know, you know, he you know, he already. He bagged and tagged Chef real quick, <laughs> right across. You just didn't even care. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's probably Lorenzo. Right, but so I wanted, to, I wanted to say something else. Yeah. I didn't know you were Jamaican. So when I tell you about Bob, what you don't know is I went to Nine Mile. I went to St. Anne, 
physically. Wow. I went to go visit his mausoleum. Like I, it was a, it was like a spiritual pilgrimage for me. So I went to Jamaica and specifically my main thing was I wanted to go, you know, go there and, and visit where he had been laid to rest. And, uh, that was yeah, a really yeah. that was a that was a cool experience. I just had to share that. I said, no, sure. that's dope. I just went yeah. there for my birthday in November. I went to St. Anne. That's where we stayed okay. uh, in the villa there. So uh, all that history, man, and just to walk those streets, uh, for uh, you know, with those who came before us, man, just so it's so inspiring, man. So motivating to 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 see where we can go, man, and what we can accomplish, man. So, mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of figuring out who you would have gotten rid of, um, I want to play this game which you call University of Dope, Daniel. Okay. And, um, Unpopular opinions are welcome as University of Dope. I've been playing with a lot of people. We love it. So we're going to do an abbreviated version, and we're going to talk about erasing one from hip-hop history. Oh, if you man. had to erase one from hip-hop history, Daniel, who would it be? Would it be A, Curtis Blow, B, EPMD, C, Kumo D, or D, Slick Rick? <sighs> You know, now you can't front on any of their contributions to the art form, but I never really liked Slick Rick's style. I didn't like the eye patch. I, it was, it's, just, it's just a matter of personal taste. You know what I mean? I love his music, you know, um, but man, I can't get rid of Kumo, B, Kumo D, EPMD. Come on, man. And Curtis, Curtis is like an architect, man. He's like, that's, 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 that'd be literally pulling out a part of the foundation. I think Slick was a little bit after Curtis. I think I'd have to go with D. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Erase one person. One got to go. Who is it? J. Cole, Drake, Kendrick Lamar, or Childish Gambino? I'm going to say Childish because he has a, so many other things going on, it really wouldn't hurt him. You see, you know, right. he's got TV shows and stuff like that. So I'll just say Childish. All right. Erase one person from hip hop history. Mecca. Vanilla. Who would it be? Vanilla, Vanilla Ice. Ice. Yes. <laughs> He's like, we ain't gotta go for it. We ain't gotta go, we have to go for that. <laughs> One gotta go. A leaders of the new school. B Beastie Boys. C Arrested Development. Or D Black Sheep. Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys. Yeah. Erase one from hip hop history. Is it A Swiss Beats? B Dr. Dre. C The RZA. Or D Timberland. Oh man. None of the above. None of the above. That one. That, I'm sorry. That was not. That's not fair. That one's not fair. <laughs> you can't. Can't do it. And I should have told you you can only pass once. But I'm gonna let you slide. <laughs> Here's the last one, Daniel. Okay. If you had to erase one from hip hop history, who would it be? A. Nas. B. The Notorious B.I.G. C. Tupac. Or D. Jay Z. Oh man. So I should have passed on this one. I'm so, oh God. I hope I never bump into this guy in New York, but I'm sorry, Nas. Nas, like Nas would have to go. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Listen, it's oh. all fun. We it love his artists. Book. Why'd we you do that? Artists. We love the music. <laughs> Unpopular opinions are welcome. It's University oh. of Dope. Daniel Sunjata, thank you for playing. Uh, let me ask you this, brother. What's next for you, man? Where can we see you? What can we support that you're doing? And where yeah. can we find you? Yeah, so um, at the, sometime towards the end of this year, I just wrapped a show called Echoes. It's a Netflix limited series, uh, only seven episodes. Uh, Michelle Monaghan, Matt Bomer from White Collar. Um, so that should come out at the end of the year. And other than that, I'm just waiting to see what the universe sends my way, man. Brother, we love you. We love what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. You're inspiring so many. Uh, don't go nowhere, man. Hold, you stay right there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Daniel Sunjata. AKA Mecca, you've seen him, you love him. He's taken off the board, but he has so much more work left that I'm certain you're gonna see him soon. This is your host, June Archer. This is the Winner Circle. This is 50.com. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Be good Thank to you, someone. My guys. All right, bye bye.